This is Mark Suster, the managing partner of Upfront Ventures, and you're watching Sachin Sayal's Ochakde Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ochak Bay Show. I'm your host, Sachin Sayal, and I'm a 16-year-old award-winning entrepreneur from the Bay Area. I'm the co-founder and CEO of 3 We're a lifestyle company transforming lives through coaching principles inspired by yoga and Ayurveda. If you're new here, this is a talk show or podcast where I interview entrepreneurs, executives, and inspiring individuals from all walks of life so we can learn from their stories and level up ourselves. The purpose of the show is to inspire you to go for it, which is what Ojakte means. Today's special guest is Mark Suster. Let me tell you some more about him. Mark is an entrepreneur and venture capitalist. He's a two-time entrepreneur and he sold both his companies and one of them he sold to Salesforce. He's a managing partner at Upfront Ventures, the largest venture capital firm in LA with $2 billion in total raised funds. Mark's also a prominent blogger in the startup venture capital world and created the blog Both Sides of the Table. So Mark, Thank you so much for being here today and welcome to the Ochakte show. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Sachin. Of course. How did the Upfront Summit go and can you share? I saw a video. It looks amazing. Can you also share like what happens there? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, if anyone wants to know more about the Upfront Summit, you can go to YouTube. We post almost all of our videos there. The only ones we don't post is if people ask us not to. So um, what we basically do is we have about 1,200 people who come. Those people are either venture capital partners. Uh, we also have a bunch of CEOs that come. And then we have like influencers who maybe want to know more about entrepreneurship, want to know more about venture capitalists. So people like uh, Serena Williams came this year, Dwayne Wade came this year. Uh, Russell Wilson came this year. And so there are often people who are super successful in their own way, and they just want to know a little bit more, meet entrepreneurs and learn more about that game. Um, so anyway, a lot of the talks that we did are live and anyone interested in it, uh, feel free to go listen to it. But the reason we do it is Los Angeles, it's the second largest city in the United States. And yet we were having a hard time getting VCs and uh, CEOs to want to come to spend time in LA. Um, and they maybe took it for granted. And I thought if we threw a big event every year, we could get more people coming. And it's been pretty successful. Awesome. I also saw the, the intro video with you and how you use like chat GPT and then you edit it. I, I, I'm going to put that in the description for this video below. I love that video. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We, we okay. try to have a little bit of fun. We do like, Kind of fun punk videos uh yeah. every day every year so if you go to youtube and you search for um upfront summit bitcoin billionaires mm -hmm. um there's also a little fun video on that too nice i'll, I'll do that okay so let's talk about your experience being a two-time entrepreneur you know you sold both your companies can you explain to my audience the process of starting a company and then selling it as well yeah so first of all, starting a company, obviously one of the things you need to do is start with an idea. Um, and what you're really trying to do is say, what do I as an individual think I know about the world that I think other people don't know? Or uh, more specifically, what ideas do I have for something that I think doesn't work well today? And if I could create a product, I could make it work better. Um, so that's the starting point. That's the inspiration. Now, as you start to work on it, you have to look at what competitors are out there. Who else has created products that do this? Am I correct in thinking that no one else is doing this well? So you start to begin to plan for what you're going to build by looking at the market. You have to imagine who's your customer. You've got to figure out what is a target customer? How much are they going to spend to access my product or is my product going to be free? and I'm gonna make money from a third party. So you need to begin to think about all of these things. And then I think the next thing you should think about is what is defensible about my product? 
So if I go out there and I create, I don't know, a shirt like this, and I say, I want to create a shirt company that creates little boring gray shirts that Mark Schuster can wear, that's fine. But what's defensible about that? Is it that I have higher quality uh, clothing, uh, fabrics? Um, or is it that I just build a brand and I want that brand to be perceived as cool? Um, am I going to have a better website where people can buy it and I attract people that way? So whatever your business is, you need to think, what customer am I serving? How am I going to do it better than other people? What competition is out there? What am I going to do that's defensible? And once you do that, Sachin, then you have to figure out how am I going to finance this? And that's where venture capital comes in. Yeah, that's exactly the next question. So awesome. What? So, I mean, some people might not know what venture capital is. So can you explain what exactly venture capital is and how you first got involved in it? Yeah, let me s describe what capital is first and then I'll go to venture capital. So let's say you wanna run a business. Um, well, if you have a business that requires money and why would a business require money? You might need to buy inventory. Again, if you wanna buy shirts, uh, you gotta buy the shirts before you sell the shirts. So it might require inventory. That's one reason for capital. Maybe you need three or four software developers to help you build your product well, they cost money, people wanna get paid. So that's another reason. Maybe you wanna, maybe you have buddies who are gonna build the software for free and maybe you don't have a physical product, but you wanna do some marketing that costs money, setting up a website, setting up servers. So you need money. The starting place is usually to raise money for what's called angels. Angels are usually wealthy individuals who are giving you money to help you do whatever you wanna do. And they're not so driven by, I need to make a hundred times my money. And angels are a great way to raise your initial capital. What venture capital is, people like myself, we raise money ourselves. And we raise money from very large financial institutions. Those institutions wanna make money. They could put their money in the bank, but the bank doesn't pay that much in interest. It pays a little bit more than it used to, but not that much. They could invest in stocks, they could invest in real estate, they could invest in gold. One of the things they want to invest in is technology companies. So they give me money and then I figure out how to give that money to entrepreneurs to create big businesses. And the goal is I should return at least three times more than they gave me. Um, and so that's what I do as my profession. I go out and I give money to people who are founding businesses. I'm usually amongst the first people who gives them money. I'll give one example, maybe some of your listeners know. We funded a little tiny business called GOAT, G-O-A-T. Do you know GOAT? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we gave them money, they had no revenue and no customers, and we worked with them to refine the business plan and come up with an idea um, to launch a sneakerhead marketplace. And now it's amongst the best places on the internet where you can buy sneakers and we sell billions of dollars of sneakers per year. But in 2015, we sold exactly zero. And what they had that other people didn't have, what they had this idea was increasingly people want to buy collectible expensive sneakers. But the problem is if you buy it on eBay, how do you know you're getting a counterfeit or a real one? So the idea was the seller would send the shoes to you, GOAT, they would inspect it and, and guarantee that it was actually authentic, put a little goat authenticity claim inside the box and then send it on to a buyer. And they just take margin on that transaction. They don't actually need inventory. That was the whole idea. And it turns out that people have a craving to get access to high quality sneakers that they know are authentic. Yeah, I mean, a lot of high schoolers are into sneakers, so. That's why it's a good, the good well, thing you shared well, this. Well, Sachin, here, here's, the, here's the intellectual framework for you, for your viewers. Mm -hmm. What I thought was, here's a great opportunity to take people who have more time than money, let's say high schoolers, mm -hmm. that are creative in how to source shoes. They could go down to the local shop and wait three hours for a shoe drop and they could get their favorite shoe. They could design ways to go to Nike's website and buy the shoes when they come out. And then you have on the other side, people with more money than time, which are usually parents. And those people, like I'm at work all day, I don't have time to go wait three hours to get shoes. So 
a sneaker that you might be able to buy for $150, I might be willing to pay $300 because I don't have three hours to waste. So you're kind of arbitraging people with more time than money with people with more money than time. Got it. Well, you talked about how like you invest in entrepreneurs. What exactly do you, what exactly do you look for when a founder pitches to you and what makes one stand out? Yeah. So the first thing I'm looking for is, uh, maybe some of your uh, listeners have heard of something called product market fit. Product market fit is when I'm offering something to the market that is truly unique, that the market really wants, and that it wants it so much that your sales are going crazy and you're struggling to keep up with demand for your product. So let's call that product market fit. When I invest, there's no product market fit. When I invest, it's just at the idea phase. So I have to imagine why would there be product market fit? So I'm doing the exact same thing I told your listeners to do if they want to create businesses is I'm thinking you present me your business and I'm thinking, do I think the world needs this product? So in the case of GOAT, um, why can't eBay do this? Well, we realize eBay does do this. They're just not very good at guaranteeing that I don't get fake. Why doesn't Nike do this? Well, Nike sells its shoes in the primary market, but in the secondary market, they don't have a presence. And then I say, if we build this, is it defensible? Well, the nice thing about marketplaces is if you can get a bunch of sellers in one place and a bunch of buyers in that same place, that's the definition of a marketplace, then it's really hard to get them all to move over here to do it somewhere else because the buyers might say, well, I want a cheaper price, but there's not enough shoes over here. And the sellers say, I want to sell somewhere where the marketplace doesn't take as much of my revenue. So I go over here and there's not enough buyers. So if you can create a marketplace and you have buyers and sellers, it's really hard to disrupt. So the first thing I'm looking for is the reason to believe there would be product market fit. The second thing I'm looking for, I call founder market fit. Why is this founder uniquely situated to do this? So Sachin, if you told me the last three years, you've been a huge sneaker head, you've learned how to buy sneakers, you have a Instagram account doing sneakers, and I can imagine why you're the right person to launch this business. That's interesting to me. If you turned around and said, I've come up with an idea for a social networking for moms, I would say, Sachin, I don't think that really fits your life experiences, right? Um, and so I'm looking secondly for founder market fit. And the third thing I'm looking for is what I call founder upfront fit. Is this someone who I think would work well with us? Because our companies that we invest in, often we have a 15 year relationship with them. You know, we give them money in 2009 and we're still gonna be there 15 years later on their board helping them succeed. So we have to believe that they wanna work the way we wanna work, which is they're competitive, hungry, wanna grow, you know, committed to this and not other businesses, that they are good at recruiting and fundraising and marketing and sales, and that if things get tough and all of a sudden the economy goes down, that they're not just gonna quit and take a job, but they're really committed to working on this company. So very long answer to a short question, but that's what we look for. No, yeah, thank you for sharing. Is there a recent deal that you're like really excited about? Um, I'd say there's a lot of deals I'm really excited about. Let me tell you about one in specific, okay? It's called okay. Bionaut, B-I-O-N-A-U-T. So uh, about five or six years ago, maybe even seven, a founder came to us. He had moved to Los Angeles from Israel, and he was a PhD in robotics, and he had an undergrad in double E engineering. And he built a company. In fact, he built the company that the iPhone uses when you take three, two or three cameras to create depth perception. So it's called computer vision. They built a company called PrimeSense, which they sold to Apple for $400 million. And for his next company, they decided they wanted to do something that had a bigger impact on the well-being of the lives of people. So they invented a robot. Remember, he's a PhD in robotics. And you inject the robot into your spine. Now, the robot is so small, it's one fifth of the width of a human hair. That's how small it is. And what they do is they inject it and they have like magnetics that go around the outside of your head on an operating table. 
and using only software and an MRI and a CAT scan, they can guide it up through the base, uh, up through your spinal fluid to the base of your brain and perform a procedure on the base of your brain. So where we would like to take this is treating diseases that form on the base of your brain that ordinarily to operate, they have to drill a, a hole in your skull and pierce a needle through your brain to get to the base of the brain. There is no other way to treat these diseases today, which include uh, cancers like glioblastoma. They include things like Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, um, and even uh, diseases that affect young children, one called Dandy Walker. Uh, so we, we're not a drug. We are a delivery device that can put something on the base of your brain. We're currently going through FDA approval and we've gone through multiple stages of approval and we will be in human trials, we hope next year. So it's a big idea, right? And yes. so what is venture capital? Venture capital is working on an idea again, that if it works, and a lot of times it doesn't work, but if it works, could change the way an industry works. And we're looking for founders that are inventing something that's really difficult to achieve, but they have unique skill sets that enable to do that. And then there's the part of life where for me, it's not just about money. Like I want to have an impact on the world. And if I could give someone $7 million that could help them change how brain cancer is treated, like awesome. I love it. Yeah, that's, I need to check that out. That sounds incredible. Yeah, it's that's called really Bionaut. Awesome it is truly incredible. And they have videos on their website to show you how they do it. Awesome. Let's talk about what does a day in the life of Mark Suster look like? Every day is different. Uh, so I'm going to try to tell you a day in the life, but told through several weeks, okay? Because it could okay. be different. But what are the activities I spend my time on? So one of the jobs of a venture capital is looking for new deals. So I'm constantly meeting with entrepreneurs, trying to find new deals. Um, and sadly, we see thousands and thousands and thousands of pitches and we do 10 to 15 deals per year. That's it. Because we're giving you millions of dollars in joining your board seat. So, you know, it's sadly, um, most of the time we have to say no. So, but I, I'm constantly looking at new deals. Number two, I, after I invest, I join the boards of companies. So I attend a lot of board meetings. Most board meetings are two to three hours. Um, once you run a company and you have investors, you usually meet every uh, four months. Uh, sorry, every three months. So you meet four times a year, every three months, every quarter. And so I attend these meetings. They can be anywhere from three hours to six hours. What do we do? We go through what were the financial results of the last three months then what happened in terms of recruiting and how much money do you have and how is your team doing? What is the product? How is the product evolving? And, and we go through and we sometimes give advice and sometimes we're listening and sometimes we encourage the CEO to take different actions in their taking. Um, I spend a lot of time um, talking with my investors. I told you that I raise money from investors and those investors also want updates on how those businesses are going. Um, I run up front, so I have a whole team that I have to manage. So we have more than 30 employees. So I'll spend time talking with all my employees about what are they working on? What are they trying to achieve? How can I help them do their job better? Uh, I mentioned to you, we run this upfront summit or you asked me about it at the start. Um, during part of the year, I'm working on booking speakers, booking meetings, getting people to the event, doing stuff like that. I attend a lot of dinners. So I host dinners where I'll bring CEOs together with VCs and we'll have a discussion about where the industry's heading. It's a way that I learn just by listening and guiding the conversation where people tell us what's going on. I play, I spend a lot of my time playing around with new products. You know, I'm sure all of your viewers are following very closely what's going with chat GPT and GPT four. Um, you know, <clears throat> we have to be up on what are the trends in technology and you can't really be up with the trends unless you're playing with technology. So that's kind of a, a day in the life. Awesome. Let's talk about both sides of the table. Um, yes. Why did you start it and what do you write about? 
Well, it's really interesting and a very good question, Sachin. I, I should tell you, like, everyone has a blog now, everyone's on social media. But um, I started blogging in 2005 when blogging wasn't a thing. And I was a CEO. And I just started writing about what was my experience like as a CEO. When my company got acquired by Salesforce.com, they required me to shut down my blog because they didn't want a record that people could look back at from Salesforce. It was a public company, so I shut it down. When I started as a venture capitalist, <laughs> there was one blog that I read that told me when I was an entrepreneur that told me how to raise capital and how to negotiate with venture capitalists and how to run a board meeting and do all this stuff. And the guy who wrote that blog was a guy named Brad Feld. And the blog I think is still called feld.com. Um, and I felt like he was giving me all the secrets. He was telling me how to work with VCs and no one else was doing that, but I really wanted to work with them. And I thought if I wanted to work with him because his blog told me so much about how to work with VCs and be an effective entrepreneur, maybe I should do the same thing. So I started the blog in 2008 and it just immediately took off and I had hundreds of thousands of people reading my blog. And I ran it very, very actively until a few years ago. I still write, I still publish. I just dialed back the amount that I publish. Got it. Yeah, that's both sides of the table.com if you want to check Thank that you. out. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, these are the last two questions that I asked all my guests. The first one is what is your best advice for teens? Listen, my best advice for teens is uh, first of all, be open to learning skill sets that will help you in life. Uh, one of those skill sets is sales and marketing. Figuring out how to sell a product, no matter what you choose to do in life, even if you want to be a doctor. Uh, I just had a dinner uh, earlier this week with a retired dentist. And we were talking about like when he started, how did he get patients? And he's like, you know, I studied dentistry. I had no idea, like, how are you going to get people to come see you as a dentist? And he realized I have to build a referral network and I have to get my patients also, you know, that which is other dentists referring. I have to get patients to want to recommend me to other people. Whatever you choose to do in life, there's an element of sales and marketing. Um, and so find opportunities to learn that skill set. Uh, number two is learn how to program. You don't have to be a developer in life. You don't have to choose to want to be a programmer, but learning the basics of how to program and getting better at it will teach you how to have intuition on technology that you can use for life. Number three, something Sachin you are excellent at is learn how to network and meet people. Here's the uh, one secret I will give everybody in life and Sachin you for whatever reason were born knowing this and most people are not most old people and i consider myself now an old person uh most old people they want to help they want to help young people they want to give back and they will always take their time to be helpful and most young people are afraid to ask and it's like kind of a weird thing to ask and so you ask someone hey would you come on my podcast i'm like a podcast for teens why not you know and so don't be afraid to network and to ask and get to know people be curious ask them about their jobs like be open to learning about them and you will go far because you'll build a collection of what we call mentors and those are people who want to help you on my blog if you want to search for it you search both sides of the table 50 coffee meetings i give advice on how to network i call it 50 coffee meetings the, the idea, maybe it's not coffee or whatever, you know, but uh, the idea is this, is if you could force yourself to meet one new person a week for 50 weeks of the year, so take time off at the holidays, but one per week, at the end of the year, you would have met 50 interesting people. The most interesting thing, Sachin, about having a, a podcast is you have a reason not just to reach out to someone like me, but you have a reason to spend time with me. Like we're spending time here today, getting to know each other just on a podcast. But yeah. the interesting thing is you could just call me and say, could we do a zoom call? And I just want to get like 15 minutes of career advice for you on what I should do after high school or how to start my business or how to raise capital. Most people will help. So if you do 50 a year, not all of them are going to be perfect. 
But at the end of the year, let's say you had five people who just really liked you and five people you really like. If you do that for five years, five years from now, you got 25 people that are going to help you change your life as you grow. So that that's probably my biggest life advice. I love that advice. And thank you so much for the kind words. Last question of the day. What was your favorite part of being on the show? What was my favorite part? Look, my favorite part is how you reached out to me. I just think uh, I, I told my wife, I told my business colleagues, you were fearless. Uh, it's something about how your parents raised you, that you were self-confident enough to reach out respectfully. You were very uh, respectful. You were very persistent with me, like constantly pushing me. And that's a skill I normally see people in their late twenties, not somebody in their teens. Um, and you, there's something special about you. I could tell from the moment you reached out to me, I don't respond. I don't respond to most strangers. Like you reached out to me cold as you yeah. very well remember. We don't need to tell people how you got on my agenda. Cause I don't want 50 more people doing it, but you were fearless, but you were a gentleman about it. And, um, and so kind and, and, uh, engaging and i found it funny and uh look that's like i just love that you do this so thank you to you thank you to you to trying to educate uh, more teens and it's special just to get to spend time doing this thank you so much mark guys make sure to hit the subscribe button and i'll see you guys next time